Welcome back to our creation seminar. We're picking up now where we left off in the study of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 in God's account at the be- of the beginning of all things. And if you remember from our last study, we finished after day 4 and we studied the sun, the moon, and the stars filling in the space that God created on day 1, which is effectively the matter of the universe, the energy of the universe, and then light and time. All of those elements now represented through these objects. And we studied that in day four. So now that moves us forward in the story of Genesis chapter one to day five. So let's pick up there. And in day five, we read this. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Well, the pattern now that we've been following since we started should be well ingrained. You should understand it very well at this point. You know what we're going to do next. We're going to start by observing many of the words that are here in this day. And we're going to start by looking at a couple of words that are familiar to us from prior days. Waters and the expanse of heaven. And if you remember now with that chart that we are using, there's a very simple way to understand which expanse, which waters we're talking about by going back and looking at the space that was created on day two. So in day two, there was an atmosphere, the waters of sorts above, and then the seas, as he later calls them, waters below the expanse. So in day five, we're filling both of those spaces. So obviously, we now understand which waters we're talking about. We know which expanse we're talking about. That would be atmosphere being filled with flying creatures and seas being filled with swimming creatures. So God creates sea creatures and birds on this day. It's a notable day for another reason. It's the first day that God creates something that he calls a living creature or a living soul would be another way to express the term living being. It's kinefesh in Hebrew, and it has some unique qualities. You notice, for example, that in the, in the account, um, you hear them reproducing, you hear them multiplying, you hear them being able to make more of their own kind. That's a unique quality of a living being. Now, plants can do the same, but you notice plants were not called living beings, not in the same way that these animals are being called living beings. So for anyone here who feels guilty about killing plants, you don't need to worry anymore. You're not actually killing something that's living, not in God's economy. Biologically, yes, there's life there. But God sets apart the life of the animal kingdom in a way that's distinct from the way he designates life generally in a biological sense. And in what way does he do that? Well, living creatures possess blood. And the idea that life is in the blood becomes a very important spiritual truth that God uses in Scripture from this point forward to teach a very important story to mankind. If you possess blood, by definition, you can experience death in in the sense of a living soul experiencing the end of itself. God uses this in a variety of ways. Uh, For example, later in Genesis, after the flood, God says this to, to mankind. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I give the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. In this passage, God is establishing a new rule for life on earth following the flood, which is that if someone was to take the life of another they themselves should lose their life as a penalty for doing so. But our focus this morning is on this quality of blood, that blood itself, God says, is the source of life. In the simple biological sense, we understand it very well. But spiritually, he's saying blood will become a representation of life, and we know how God later uses this representation when he gives the law to Israel. In Leviticus, he says, for example, The priest is to take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. Clearly, we begin to see God using this concept of living things have a special form of life which is embodied or represented by the blood of that individual or that object, that thing, like an animal. 
And in so doing, he then gives us an opportunity to understand the consequences of sin, which is death, and the need for an atoning to cover sin, which is to take the life of one and assign it to another. The life of an animal in the case of the sacrificial system was represented by the blood of that animal, and it was assigned to cover the sin of a human being. And of course, the writer of Hebrews tells us that was never to be a once and for all offering. It was not sufficient, but it was temporary and it was uh, symbolic. It was intended to teach something so that we would understand where true atonement comes from. Later, we get that in the New Testament. Jesus, speaking of himself, says, for this is my blood, speaking of the wine that was used in the final supper. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And John says, but one of, at the time of Christ's death, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. So in day five, we're seeing animals created, particularly sea and birds, sea animals and birds. And the emphasis here is on a special kind of life, life that can be lost, life that can be transferred as, in a sense, spiritually speaking, that blood can be used to make a point of life being transferred. And God intended to use that later with his son. So another detail in the creation made so in order for God to use it later to explain something spiritually important to all of us. The blood represents the movement of life from one to another. That's what we all need, of course. Because of sin, we stand in jeopardy before a holy and just God unless and until he covers that sin by appointing someone else in our place and for us to receive the life of a perfect sacrifice in place of our own sinful life. Now, of course, by faith in Christ, we receive that. So in day five, you find an opportunity for a revisiting of the day-age theory that we looked at way back on the very first verses of the chapter. In chapter one, when we opened the Bible and looked at verses one and two, if you remember, I said that there was, in some people's mind, a gap of time between verse one and verse two. And in that gap, they presume a number of things happen, and particularly with some uh, we would call them creational uh, evolutionists. Uh, these are folks who believe that you can reconcile creation and evolution, that the story of chapter 1 is a story of God creating through evolution. And in order to make that conclusion, they have to find a lot of time. Because in the way the story reads, it's only six days, but evolution would take millions and millions of years. So as we said back in that earlier part of Genesis, they assign one day... <coughs> a million years or something of that sort, uh, a complete conjecture not supported by the text. But as we reach day five, there's another opportunity to try to make that argument. And in this case, they look at the progression of creation through various days, particularly as we reach day five, and they note that it corresponds, or so they say, to the pattern of evolution that evolution blame happened. For example, in their perceived... Uh, chart or their perceived view of how animal life evolved from lower forms to higher forms, evolutionists would claim that first you started with basic sea creatures moving to higher order sea creatures, eventually reaching land creatures, and then finishing off with the largest land creatures. And so if they were to look at days one through five, it appears to them that things are tracking in a very similar way, that we are seeing evolution in a sense play out over a long period of time. But in evolution, evolved from land animals, the idea of gaining flight is seen by evolutionists to be a last stage evolution. That you don't obviously go from being in the water to immediately flying. They expect some time on the ground in order for the development of wings to happen in their way of seeing things. But did you notice in the story of creation, we've broken that pattern? Because in day five, we have birds coming before land animals, which come on day six. So here again, even if someone wanted to try to reconcile evolution and creation in this ham-handed way, this, this odd way, they're still not able to do it. You'd have to say, well, in that particular case, the days are out of order. But as you keep making exceptions to everything the Bible says, at what point does the Bible mean anything to you anyway? You might as well just toss the whole thing out and go with Darwin, because all of these efforts to reconcile them just keep showing that they can't be reconciled. God has said it one way, and Darwin and those who hold to his view have taken a different route, and the two don't meet. Never mind what we said last time, which was it nullifies Christ's death on the cross to think that death came before sin. 
But I want to address them as we pass through it so that you'll have at least something in your mind as you come, al come across this argument in the future. So back to our chart. Now we've seen water filled, atmosphere filled, and this day is the fastest of all the days we study for that very reason because we see sea creatures and birds filling those spaces, each of them told to multiply and fill the earth. That's a way of saying God did not establish the full number of them on day one. He established some number of them, and then that number was to grow on its own as we see happening. If you stop for a moment and you think about that, the idea of multiplication, if God had asked all these creatures to multiply, there's a clear inference that this should just go on in an unending way, right? Well, there's a finite limit to how, much, how many fish could fit in the sea. There's a finite limit to how many birds could find uh, places on the earth to land. I mean, it would be an incredibly huge number, obviously, but it is finite. The only way it does not reach a limit is by what? By death. So even in day five, prior to the arrival of sin and death, God has already set forth a standard for the environment, if you will, the standard for nature that will at some point necessitate death. What I'm saying is this. Once again, you see evidence that God is anticipating where creation is going. He knows that death is going to happen. He's not the author of it, but he anticipates it and he plans for it such that he creates in the animal kingdom the capacity to replace itself knowing that it can't live forever in what's about to happen. 